Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. This passage of scripture just reminded me so much of that and how much more we, uh, we need to be involved as laborers together this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, and I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet are you now able, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not yet carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that plants anything, neither is he that waters but God that gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Let's open in a word of prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we pray that as we look at this word, you would challenge us. Challenge us in areas that maybe we need to make some changes in our lives this morning. Maybe we need to be getting more involved. Maybe we need to be looking to you as our master builder and follow in your example. Lead us. Use your word to challenge us this morning. Use this vessel, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get started, uh, as we get started this morning, I want to share a little story that I found quite a few years ago, and I know some of you have heard my story of a carpenter shop and the tools therein. Troy, I'll have him put up the, uh, the list of characters, the cast of characters, as you see there. We've got a hammer and a saw and a gimlet, and, and I'm not sure if you all know what that is, but you'll see here in a moment. A screw, a plane, a ruler, and sandpaper. Here we go. Early one morning, long before the carpenter was to appear in his shop, the carpenter's tools decided they need to have a little conference to settle some problems that had been arising in their work. The first tool called to the chair was Brother Hammer. Those at the meeting informed him that he was going to have to leave the workshop because there was a problem. Brother Hammer was just too noisy with his work, always making a ruckus. Bang, bang, bang. But wait, he said, if I'm to leave then so must Brother Saw. He's always cutting things apart and cutting up. Well, replied Brother Saw, if I'm going to have to leave this carpenter shop, then so is Brother Gimlet. And Troy, we got that picture. You seen what a gimlet is? It's just a little tool that makes a small impression. Well, here we go. But little Brother Gimlet rose to his feet. And he said, all right then, but Brother Screw must go also. Him, you have to turn around and around again and again just to get him to go anywhere. But Brother Screw replied, if you wish, I'll go, but Brother Plain must leave as well. All of his work is just on the surface. There's no depth to it at all. To this, Brother Plain replied, well, Brother Rule, 
You'll have, uh, Brother Rule will have to withdraw as well, if I do. For he's always measuring other folks as though he were the only one who was right. Brother Rule then complained against Brother Sandpaper and said, I don't care. He's rougher than he ought to be. He's always rubbing people the wrong way. Well, for a few minutes here, we're going to leave our little tool conference and, look, and all of their problems, and we're going to look at, going to break down this, these pieces in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 this morning and look at this whole idea of being laborers together, working together as one. And you can see in this list of characters, they've all got their flaws, but they've also all got their strengths. Kind of like the uh, workings of a church, isn't it? This morning, we're going to look at three main points. The failure of the church, that's in verses 1 through 4, walking as men. The function in the church, and that's walking as ministers. Number three, the foundation of the church, that's the warning to its members. Point number one, the failure of the church. The problem experienced is the problem that exper- was, was, was uh, going on, this, the same kind of problem was going on at the church of Corinth at this particular time. And the Apostle Paul tells him again in verses 1 through 4, Brothers, uh, I, I can't speak to you as spiritual, but as carnal, as babes. I fed you with milk and not meat because you're not able to bear it. You're carnal. One says, I'm a Paul. Another says, I, there, there's arguing. There's things going on here. Carnal instead of spiritual is one of the problems that he sees. Babies instead of maturity and divided instead of being united. He first of all calls them carnal. Carnal means fleshly, means flesh. The people were were here, and again, we're not talking about unbelievers here. Paul calls them brethren. We know that these are saved individuals. He calls them brothers. But here's the problem. They were not crucifying the daily needs of the flesh. If you would read on in in 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 3 uh, through through about 8, you'll find uh, what what some of these these problems are. The books will will reveal all sorts of sins that were taking place in the church at Corinth. Adultery, immorality of various sorts, idolatry, the inability to control their bodies and the the lustful desires therein, and many more. This book is full of some of the problems that were taking place within the church. And you say, well, that was a long time ago. Things like this don't happen in the church of today. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Just about every one of these, if not all of them, and probably more at some times, exist in the church of today. They were not allowing, why are they there? Because they're not allowing the Holy Spirit to control their lives. They were giving in to the uh, evil desires of the flesh. You look around the world and you see all of these things, But you also see them in the church. Maybe they're not as bold and out there, but maybe they're there. And we just let it pass by. Well, Paul goes on. He's called them already carnal, fleshly, evil desires, but he also calls them babies. He says that they are not mature. Babies are a lot of fun. I love little babies. I love going to the hospital and and seeing those those cute little bundles of wrapped up stuff there. They're adorable. And they make the funniest sounds. They smell sometimes really good. Sometimes not so good. Paul calls them babies. He says, he says uh, it, it literally means unable to speak here. Well, I love watching them try to talk as they're growing older. Can you understand their language? If you've got it figured out, 
let the parents of today know what they're saying. Because it's unable, it's a language all of their own. Now, sometimes you can maybe figure it out, shove the pacifier in their face or give them a bottle or, or something. Maybe that's what they want. Maybe it's not. But they're unable to speak. Um, and this is what Paul is, is referring to. They were so immature that in their conversation, they don't really know what they're talking about. It just doesn't make sense. Look over at, at uh, another passage using the same word, very similar word, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 14, another word is used. It says that we henceforth are no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The same word children is, is the same word that's translated babe in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. Look what happens to these immature individuals in Ephesians. It says that they're tossed to and fro, carried about away uh, with every wind of doctrine. This is the idea that there are false teachers trying to deceive them as well. And, and because they don't know, because they don't understand, and, and they don't even know what they're talking about, they're so easily swayed to follow after the false teachers and the deceit that is out there. Uh, lately, at our door, and it's kind of off the subject a little bit, we've had just about every stripe of, of, uh, of individual that comes and knocks on doors and tries to convince you that, that there's some truth that they have for you. We've had everything from, from uh, Bible-believing uh, churches to those who are, uh, uh, the Bible warns and says, uh, don't even speak to them. We've had all kinds of different ones. So they're out there trying to confuse us. So are we carnal? Are we babes in Christ? Or are we mature as we go through? Let's think about this. The Corinthians' immaturity and carnality uh, was directly related to their failure to grow up. Well, what does that mean this morning? What does it mean that they have not chosen to grow up? I remember when I was young, I wanted nothing more than to be older. And as I got older, I wanted nothing more than to be even more older, if that's the right terminology, older anyway, so I would be looked at as, as mature and as an adult. And as I be, have become an older adult, I want nothing more than to go back and be young again. Now, that's, that has nothing to do with this, but you kind of see what, what the idea is. There is a pattern of growth in our lives. There's also so be, supposed to be a pattern of growth in our spiritual as well. The failure to grow up as Paul is talking about here, in the Word of God. Immature believers may know a lot of Bible stories, and you find that. They might know a lot of those, and they might be able to, to even tell you the basic facts of salvation, but they're not pressing on to spiritual maturity. Look over at Hebrews chapter 5 for a moment. Hebrews chapter 5. And we'll begin reading in verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 5. It says, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for a time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be of the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become again as have a need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is here it is, that word again, a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and on the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead, and of the eternal 
judgment. The context in the passage, uh, as it's talking about here, is that the author is trying to explain to his audience about the priesthood of Melchizedek. But he says that they're, they're dull of hearing. They're not getting it. They don't understand where he's going. He says they're immature. They have to be taught again the simple principles of the Word of God. When by this time, and he's looking at, at, at the time from when he was there before to when he's come back on his journey, this is a, the Apostle Paul, that there should have been some spiritual growth here. But for some reason, they're still doing, still doing the same things that they were doing when he was there. And when he taught them the things of Christ, when they accepted the things uh, of Christ, and yet they're still not there. They're still not able to discern good from evil. The word perfection that, he, that is used in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, carries with it the idea of completeness, or the word that we uh, become familiar with, maturity. These believers are, are in need to be building on the elementary principles of uh, just the basic doctrines, when by this, team, this time they should know a whole lot more. He says it's vitally important that we reach the lost with the gospel, but you see, that's not enough. Even today, it is important that we lead boys and girls, men and women to Jesus Christ, but then our job isn't done. We have a task, we have a job, we have a responsibility to lead them into maturity, to help them on their way. We just don't leave them on their own. Boy, they, they flounder if that happens. We've run across many individuals that, that claim to know Christ, but that's it. They weren't taught the basics of how to dig into the Word of God, how to communicate with the Father. And I know we've talked about that over the course of, of uh, pastors been, been doing that over the course of the scriptures that we've been looking at the responsibilities that we have to continue to teach others. We must be encouraging and helping them to grow up in Christ. They need to know that the salvation that they have is not the end, but it's just the beginning of great and greater things yet to come. You see, it's a shame when people have sat in church in churches like ours, maybe even in our church, and they still don't understand just a little bit of depth of Scripture. But as, he, as Paul uh, as is used in the Scripture, they're, they're very surface. They might know the simple stories, but we don't understand any depth that this comes from the Word of God. The mark of Christian immaturity was, that, was, was part, in part their attitude and their behavior. Back in verse 3 of, of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what did we see there? We saw envyings or jealousy in some scriptures, strife or the word contention. We saw division in the church. These things are all uh, linked together and actually one a product of another. Uh, as you would. It's a, it's a downward spiral. We're going to look at that here in just a second. Think about this as we start at the top with envying. Envying could be a better translated jealousy. The distinction is because envying deci desires to de deprive uh, another of what he has, while jealousy wants what another has for himself. The Christians, the Corinthians uh, here were jealous, wanting what someone else had for themselves. Do we find ourselves looking at that and longing for the things that the world has, the things that maybe other believers have? Maybe even, boy, I wish I had knowledge, Bible knowledge like this person or that person. You find yourself jealous of what they have, so we, we want to take the shortcut. We want it right now, what they have, without Kind of like things, striving to get it for ourselves. Jealousy, nearly always connected with the next word, and that's strife, or the word contention. Jealousy quickly degenerates to this contention. A desire, because we want to make war against that other person. 
And it's easy to see how then contention leads to division. The word division literally means to stand away or to stand apart from, to separate ourselves from. Because of jealousy, which leads to strife or desire to make war, there comes division. The standing away, the separating of believers from one another. Paul is seeing that in the Corinthian church. These things are happening. It's right there. He says, we've got a problem. We've got to fix this. We are to be, and we'll look at it as we, we move on. We need to be unified, laborers together. Division came in, in part, as we, we find in 1 Corinthians in this particular situation, because of, the, uh, of, of uh, uh, the division came because of they were arguing over who to follow. Who was the better individual to follow after? And remember, it was, the, the, it was Paul and Apollos here. These two individuals, uh, man, you get down to those nitpicky little things. It, it, that reminds me of things that take place, it, uh, took place when I was a kid on the playground. And you know what? Those things still don't change. You watch kids out on the playground. It's that old idea of, of, of uh, I'm tougher than you are. My daddy's better than your daddy. Well, your mommy wears army boots. And, and we, this battle back and forth when... That's not at all what's to be taking place in the, the uh, uh, Christian arena. Looking for a person to be a hero, hero to them, um, an athlete, a, a great singer, uh, an actor. Uh, boy, you talk to these young people this last week at, at, uh, at the soccer camp. Who is your hero? Who do you look up to? And because we were in the soccer setting, man, they knew soccer players I've never even heard of. And I still don't know who they are. I was watching some of them from the Brazil team. I was watching some of the Brazil, Brazil team soccer yesterday, and I still couldn't figure out who some of those guys were that they were talking about. But we want someone to look up to. Well, what about within the church? Who do we look up to? Who do we want to be like? In, in this setting, they were arguing over Paul and Apollos, both great teachers. Both great men, but arguing over something as simple as that. The Spirit always brings unity in the body. Look back at Ephesians. We were there before, but uh, in chapter 4, but look earlier. He, Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 1, it says there, I therefore... The prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation which you were called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, there's one Spirit, even as you were called in one hope of your calling, one faith, or one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you, in you all, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Jesus Christ. We are to walk worthy, humble, meek, in a manner after the one to whom we are to be following. Who is that? The only person that ought to be out there as, as, as one to whom we want to follow is the Lord Jesus Christ. None other, no other hero of any sort, but after Jesus Christ and Him alone. Look now at, at, at another passage. Look at uh, Philippians, just over a few pages in your Bible. Philippians chapter 2. And the passage is, is actually that we want to look at, and I'm not going to read it all for the sake of time this morning, but it's, it's verses 1 through 15, and especially in, in verse 2, verse 2 especially is what we want to look at and note. It says, fulfill you my joy, in verse 2, that you may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done in strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, 
Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the, on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. Which mind? That mind which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, being found in the fashion of men. And he humbled himself. He became obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And you can look on uh, in these, uh, these next uh, few verses here. But, but this is part of the mystery of the church, that out of many nations, out of many cultures, out of many backgrounds, God calls us together for a purpose, a single purpose, a purpose of being a shining light, a shining light to the world of Jesus Christ himself and him crucified. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, that the world would know them how? By their love that they would have one for another. The song Sarah sang, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. If you listen to the words, there was a whole message right there in that special music. The deep, deep love of Jesus that the world would know who we are by the love that we have one for another. We're to be like-minded. We're to be actively seeking out ways to be, be encouraging one another, lifting one another up, not looking for ways to tear down. The failure of the church, walking as men. Which leads us to point number two, the function in the church, and that is to be, we are to be working as ministers. After showing the Corinthians their, their failure to grow up, <coughs> excuse me, Paul reminds them of their, their function. They are to be uh, working together, serving together that one true living God. We are God's servants working together. King James uses the word laborers together. I like that word, laboring one another together. The bottom line is not only that we are laborers, but we're also together as we labor together, working out our imperfections together, struggling with our incompleteness together. It's that we labor as we labor, remembering that God is also laboring too. He's working in us and through us. What a process, what a neat process of growth. God is at work in us and through us in our relationship with Him, but as we labor and work together one with another. What a neat function of the church that we are to be helping one another to grow to full maturity. I'll tell you, we can if we want to. You can look around and you can find all kinds of faults. You can look right up here and find faults. But you can look around and find faults, if that's what we want to do. But ought we not be doing what we're supposed to be doing, is looking around and seeing where there might be weaknesses and helping to encourage and build up instead of furthering the cause of tearing down? The bottom line isn't that we're only laboring together in a partnership that builds on our our. our competitive natures, but that you and I are to work together only because it is God who's been ahead of us, working ahead of us, maturing us into believers that we ought to be. We are His servants working together, laboring together. What a great function. Paul tells the Corinthians that the division in the church over the personalities is, is totally pointless. He said, men are just ministering servants. He graciously allows us, God allows us to be, be a, a privileged part of His work. And we must never forget that as we work, as we minister, as we labor together, it's not our work. I think that's where we mess up sometimes. Is as we're involved in the ministries of the church, we take it on as ours and forget that it's really His. It's His work. The only way that God will bless is that, that we look at these things. We can come up with the plans and the schemes and all of those things, but when we get all done, it's His work that we're doing His way, and we will receive blessings as we give Him, God, the glory for all of these things. 
Well, we saw that this, this last week. Working together, and, and man, I heard this several times. You know, to God be the glory. God, uh, boy, God ought to be uh, just thrilled about this group that we had here and as we're working together. You heard those terms. What an exciting thing as we work together for His glory and not our own. We must never lose fact, uh, sight of the fact that it's Him and Him alone that we serve. True, true ministry is given by God, and so then is any fruit that comes. When we saw boys and girls come to, to talk to the adults about what it means to be a, a believer in Jesus Christ, to Him be the glory because of the fruit that may come therein. It's not our fruit, it's His and His alone. Paul also goes on to show that, that even though he plants and Apollos watered, even though their ministries are different, it's still part of the same ministry. Look at uh, Romans 12. Very familiar. We know the, uh, the first two verses really well of Romans 12, 1 and 2. You hear that often. But look at verse 3. It says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is, a, is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly, according to as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, all members have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Jesus Christ. Think about that. What a neat opportunity we have. We all work together. We're all on the same team. That's where I really enjoyed uh, the, the soccer. I don't know much about soccer. I'll confess that. I am not a soccer player, never played soccer in my life. Well, I played around with soccer, but not like these guys do. But it is a team sport. Those guys are, are strategically kicking the ball to one another. And sometimes I wonder, as they're moving forward, why are they kicking it backwards? That doesn't make sense to me. The goal is up there, and you kicked it this way. It's because there's a team member back there that can kick it to somebody else. That's neat. Working together for one common purpose. Well, the same thing in the church. We all have different functions and different abilities, and God wants us to work together with our different makeups for His glory and His glory alone, that we all can become one in this ministry that we have the function of the church is we work together as ministers of Jesus Christ. You look back at the, at the, uh, the carpenter shop now, just briefly. Told you we'd come back to the story. But as they're in the midst of their discussion, in walks the carpenter. The carpenter of Nazareth. He surprised them by showing up earlier than they expected. 